Ladies and gentlemen, Ed Gillespie. Thank you very much, David. Um, a great welcome. So um, I'm going to kick straight off into this. You've had the introduction. You don't need to know any more about me. So I want to talk this morning about stories. Uh, dog sniff bottoms, we tell stories. And our stories are the way we make sense of the world around us, how we connect with each other, and, and understand our relationship with the planet. And we're living in a very difficult world. We'll see some themes like this coming through this morning. But you know the times are changing when even the Pentagon is talking about a volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world. So this is what we're trying to, to navigate and understand. And you know it's interesting when the political debates are focused between someone like Russell Brand uh, and Johnny Rotten. That seems to be where the most lively political discussion is going on in the UK right now. Um, and also, we're, we're dealing with some big facts. We've lost 50% of our vertebrate species in the last 40 years. Uh, and Alice and Pete will talk about these later on. And we're probably on course for probably around four degrees of climate change. So we know we have big challenges that we have to try and address. And if you read Naomi Klein's new book, which is saying capitalism versus the climate, this changes everything. This is the narrative that we have to get out of, the story of Western-dominated, extractive type of approach to the natural world. Um, and we've also seen people drawing the moral equivalence around divestment from climate change and fossil fuels with the end of apartheid South Africa. So there's a strong moral case here, and even these extreme left-wing radicals like Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, are now saying most fossil fuel reserves can't be burned. So we can see and feel that something is shifting and something is changing. Um, equally, um, it's not about killing ourselves. Um, we're not about giving up here. This is actually about doing brilliant, beautiful, and better things. That's what sustainability uh, is all about. And so my book was really about trying to understand a different story of travel, a different story of tourism, uh, an idea of being able to go through the world rather than over it, and that by giving up flying, it wasn't actually a sacrifice, it was actually a rediscovery of all the romance of what made overland adventure brilliant. Um, and as David said, you know, I started off as a marine biologist. Uh, I, I realized I was going to spend my whole life saying, if you don't stop catching all the fish, there won't be any fish. So I got into broader environmental campaigning because I was worried that actually the things that we're prepared to do are often inversely proportional to the impact of those actions i.e. the things that we're happy to do, like not taking our plastic bags, are the things that actually don't make much difference. And the single biggest behavior in terms of carbon intensity is usually getting on a plane. So I wanted to try and address this idea because we're in the driving seat now. You know, we're in a geological era that is the Anthropocene, where we are the key force shaping the future and fate of life on the planet. And rather than being an intimidating thing, I think that's actually enormously inspiring because it means now we know exactly how buggered the world is, we have a chance of trying to fix it. Uh, and we know that travel has become commodified, increasingly turned into a package to be consumed, where it is all about you, the individual, having your experience. You know, the Mobile Network 3 has done this campaign saying, sorry for all the sunsets being shared by social media and the cocktails by the pool and the hot dog legs uh, on the beach. And really, actually, most of the joy of travel or travel anecdotes comes from schadenfreude. No one wants to hear about the great time you had on your holiday lounging by the infinity pool sipping a cocktail. Everyone wants to know about what went wrong. Uh, everyone wants to know about the disaster, the nightmare, the traumatic experience. Um, so that's partly also what my book focuses on. Because if you look at where we're flying now, it started to get a little bit crazy. Uh, I always say the world is a small place and we should stop buzzing around it like flies in a jar. Um, and I wanted to find out and get back to that Zen principle of the journey being the reward. That actually, especially if you go all the way around the world from Brixton, where I live, because ultimately you're going to end up in Brixton, uh, which is a great place, but perhaps not worth going all the way around the world to get to. Um, I also thought about doing it in 80 ways, uh, but then I made a list, and my Excel spreadsheet got very complicated, uh, and I realized I was going to have to ride a lot of animals, not all of which would have been available, or indeed willing, uh, along the way. Um, so this is the route, uh, basically across through Asia, down through um, Southeast Asia and Australia, across the Pacific, Central America, and back to London. Um, 
45,000 miles, 31 countries, 381 days, and 1.8 tons of carbon. Now, interestingly, that's actually less carbon than I usually consume while I'm in the UK. So my advice to you is, if you want to cut your carbon footprint, go around the world without flying and actually save carbon. Um, so this is where we started off. The very first leg of the trip was uh, a cargo ship, I mean, not a cargo ship, a car ferry uh, to the port of Bilbao, crossing the Bay of Biscay, where the, the weather went from this to this, uh, 25 foot swells, and uh, the ship tossing around uh, on the ocean, with the captain coming on the tannoy and saying, I'd just like to reassure everyone, it's a good ship, it's a strong ship, uh, sounding like he was trying to convince himself. Um, and then we took the Trans-Siberian through uh, what was a very boggy spring melt in Siberia. I think one of the reasons that the former Soviet Union was so bullish during the Cold War is that if you're in Siberia, it looks like the apocalypse has already happened. And across Lake Baikal, with this enormous um, body of fresh water, one of the biggest bodies of fresh water in the world, where we went ice fishing. Uh, this is Sergei, who is uh, known as the kind of the Tom Selleck of Siberia, a moustache and gold teeth. And this is ice fishing, where when you catch your first fish, he calls himself the fishing priest, and he baptizes you by whacking you around the face with it. Um, and then into Mongolia, where you get these vast open spaces in the Gobi Desert. Um, it's very interesting traveling in a place where there literally are no roads. Uh, you can pretty much go where you like. And it's an extraordinary landscape uh, in Mongolia. You know, huge skies, you know, vast um, untouched lakes, uh, these inland seas, uh, craggy volcanoes, and insane dogs, um, some of the scariest dogs I've ever seen in the world. Uh, there's actually the traditional Mongolian greeting on approaching someone's yurt is uh, Nokori Koi, which just basically means, please hold your dogs. Um, you often see, and obviously Mongolia is also facing some of the worst challenges of climate change in the fact that it's already experienced two degrees, and so you see a lot of um, carcasses and, and skeletons and bones lying around all over the desert um, as you go through the landscape. Um, it's also intriguing in terms of some of the, um, the niceties of travel. Um, this is actually quite unusual for a Mongolian toilet, and in actual fact, it has a structure uh, above it. The first night we stayed in a yurt, we said to the guy, uh, where do you go to the toilet? And he just sort of went, take your pick. Uh, and as you can see, it's not a landscape with a lot of ground cover. So you soon understand what constitutes a polite distance. Um, and then there's the joys of ordering food, obviously in multiple different languages. Uh, this was the result of going into a particular restaurant in Shanghai Guan in China, uh, where you, know, you look at the menu, you realize you can't read the menu. Uh, you have a kind of smile with the waitress, she gives you her pad. Uh, you draw a chicken, you hand the pad to her, she draws an egg. Uh, then you wonder whether you're having a philosophical debate or actually trying to order your dinner. Um, and then dinner arrives and uh, you don't quite know where to start. And you can also get into all sorts of trouble with incidents that you don't necessarily plan. This is the other thing about overland adventure. Uh, this is by the Great Wall of China. Um, and I was quite amused to see that there was a large marijuana patch growing around the base of the wall. So of course I had my photo taken, um, which was going to come back to haunt me about a week later in uh, Japanese customs after arriving on a ferry into Kobe. Uh, and they pulled me aside and they were going through my bag and they found some dodgy looking Vietnamese rolling tobacco. And the customs officer says, marijuana? I said, no, 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 this is, uh, this is rolling tobacco. And he went, no, 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 it's marijuana, I must make a test. So he starts getting out his testing kit to, uh, to look at the tobacco. Meanwhile, his colleague is going through my bag and has pulled out my digital camera and is flicking through the photos and finds this picture, taps me on the shoulder and says, marijuana? I said, yeah, there is marijuana. He goes, where is this? I said, it's in China. I said, they didn't pick any. He goes, you smoke marijuana? And I was getting slightly arsy by this point, so I said, yes, I've smoked marijuana. He goes, when you smoke marijuana? I said, three months ago. He said, where you smoke marijuana? I went, Amsterdam. And they both went, Oh, Amsterdam. Uh, like, as if to say, if we were in Amsterdam, we would smoke marijuana. Um, and then, of course, there's the joys of the Japanese techno toilet. Who's used a Japanese techno toilet? A few people in the room. Billy Connolly once said, never trust a man who, when left alone in a room with a tea cosy, doesn't try it on. Uh, and, a, and a similar kind of principle applies to the techno toilet. Is that I defy anyone with a sense of curiosity not to press all the buttons. Uh, just to see what happens. Um, without going into details, let's just say, as a man, if you press the female douche, it's surprisingly refreshing. 
Um, then, of course, there's, you've got to get across the oceans when you're not flying. Uh, one of the, the best options is to get on cargo ships. So this is on an enormous cargo ship called the Theodore Storm. A uh, very new cargo ship. It was only two or three years old when we were on it. Ukrainian captain, very proud. He's saying, uh, I just, this is like the Lamborghini of the cargo ship world. Um, I'm not quite sure it has the glamour factor. Uh, but yeah, you sit in the port of Singapore watching all these enormous containers get loaded onto the ships. It's a fascinating insight into how so much of world trade is conducted. Um, and you have this extraordinary journey down through the islands uh, of Indonesia with the live volcanoes sort of puffing uh, on the horizon. Um, and then we arrived in the Glasshouse Mountains um, in Brisbane. And one of the Filipino crew had been hurt uh, on the ship during the journey. And this is one of the other things about travel, you know, connecting with different cultures, languages, accents. Uh, anyway, this Filipino seaman was being helped off the ship on a stretcher, and the big brawny Queenslander paramedic said to him, he said, don't worry, mate, we're taking you to hospital to die. Uh, but what the Filipino heard was, don't worry, mate, we're taking you to hospital to die. Uh, and nearly leapt off the, the stretcher in horror. And a lot of the, the kind of wonderful thing about going around the world is obviously connecting with, with nature and the extraordinary kind of legacy of, uh, of the natural world that surrounds us. And these are, this is a cowrie tree in New Zealand. And it's also really humbling to remind ourselves that you know, the North Island of New Zealand was once full of these trees, which take nearly a thousand years to grow to maturity. And yet we cut them, nearly all of them down uh, you know, when, after the British uh, arrived in New Zealand. And, the tragedy is that's not just going to be a generation. That will be multiple generations before those carry forests ever recover to a semblance of what they once were. Um, but perhaps the most striking and powerful example of this is actually a place I went to in the mountains of Mexico, a place called Michoacan, uh, uh, and a village called Angangueo. And Angangueo is the overwintering grounds of the monarch butterfly. Anyone who knows anything about the monarch butterfly will know that this is they're the world's best traveled insect. Every year they fly north from this little tiny spot in the Mexican mountains as far north as Canada. And then they come back to overwinter the following season. And the truly remarkable thing is the butterflies which return the next year are the fifth generation of the butterflies which left the previous year. So they're the great great grandchildren who do this annual cycle. And it's an extraordinary intergenerational journey, which I think is a really evocative thing of what we're talking about in terms of tackling climate change. Because we ain't going to fix it in our lifetime. Our children and our children's children and probably our great-great-grandchildren will also be dealing and living with and adapting to climate change that we are putting in place now. And it's an absolutely extraordinary place. You know, the kind of trees are literally laden with these butterflies. Uh, and there's, absolutely, there's an amazing book uh, called Flight Behavior by Barbara Kingsolver. Uh, which is based on the disruption, or partly inspired by the disruption of the migration uh, of these butterflies. And there's a wonderful line in the book where a climate scientist is talking to uh, another skeptical journalist who's asked the scientist another frustrating question. And he said, we're at the top of Niagara Falls in a canoe, and we got here by drifting. Well, we cannot turn around for a lazy paddle back when you finally stop pissing around. We've arrived at the point of an audible roar. Does it strike you as a good time to debate the existence of the falls? And this is the story of where we're at. This is a story of our time and with the story of our intergenerational challenge uh, on, on tackling climate change. And equally, there were other places which made me think and reflect during this journey. Like, this is in uh, Tikal, in the Guatemalan rainforests. And anyone who knows the story of the Maya will understand that you know, their civilization was once a great and dominant civilization in the area. It's, it's, it actually survived and thrived for over 800 years. And then it disappeared. It dissipated. But it didn't crash. What happened was a change in their climate changed their rainfall regime and their ability to c control and retain adequate water resources to sustain dense civilization. So actually, we can learn a lot from the kind of the consciousness and awareness of these other civilizations have also butted up against their own catastrophic uh, and transformative climate change. And equally, you know, you can also have these feelings about the thin skin of civilization when you're walking across um, the crater of a live volcano. Um, again, this is in Guatemala, and we're walking across the rocks, you know, as this kind of smoke and steam and intense heat is coming up. And I did actually say to the guide, I said, how thick is the rock here? And he went, oh, at least five meters. But you can actually see in the background there, it's definitely not five meters. It was literally just below our feet. But I think, again, this is a good metaphor for the thin skin of civilization on we, which we currently tread. And so much 
of traveling through the world and traveling in this slow and overland way comes back to what I call the overview effect. And the overview effect was actually first um, understood and described uh, by astronauts um, who, when they first got up into orbit, looked down and have that kind of very famous epiphany about looking at the kind of the fragility and vulnerability of the world, the interconnectedness and interdependence of all life, um, and the isolated fact of our position in the universe. And bearing in mind these guys and gals tend to be sort of fairly hard-bitten um, ex-military test pilots, you know, to have, for them to have these kind of conversions is quite extraordinary. Um, and I really think that actually when you travel through the world, you actually realize that what, what it have in common and what connects us is actually much, much bigger than the relatively petty differences that separate us. And if you travel overland from London to Mumbai, when you arrive in Mumbai, you don't feel the same kind of culture shock as if you flew straight from Heathrow uh, and arrived discombobulated and disconnected. So overland travel creates a kind of grounded overview effect uh, of, of what we share. And sometimes we need to be reminded of what is so obvious to us. The great writer David Foster Wallace said, tells a great story about these two goldfish swimming along. Uh, and they bump into an older goldfish. The older goldfish says, all right, boys, how's the water? And the two young fish go, what the hell is water? Uh, and the point he's making is that the things that which are, are most obvious and most apparent to us are the things that we need to be reminded of. That there is only one of us here, that we are an integral part of the natural world, and we are interdependent with it. We are not separate from it. What we do to nature, we ultimately do to ourselves. And that should be the rallying cry for a new story and a new understanding of the way that we interact with each other uh, and with the planet around us. Because we need to resize our world. You know, when people say it's a small world, they say, well, if you travel over every last dusty inch of it and bounce on every briny wave, let me reassure you, it's massive. Uh, flying makes the world seem small, but you can resize your planet to its normal size uh, by actually getting off the plane uh, and traveling overland. And sometimes we need to be jolted out of these complacencies. Uh, this is a picture taken from the back door of my flat in Brixton, South London, of a typically uh, contrail crisscross sky over London. And it's interesting because we'll all remember a few years ago when this little baby went up, um, Aya Kjaja Fjerkel, um, I've been practicing that, uh, in Iceland. And, you know, the, that ash cloud actually grounded all of European avi aviation for over two weeks. And the extraordinary thing was it, jo it jolted us out of our established patterns of behavior. All the journalists went down to the channel ports to welcome these UK travelers who'd had to do these overland journeys across the continent because they couldn't get on a plane, expecting to hear complaints and gripes and groans about the horrors. And instead, most people were getting off the ferries and going, it was great. I never realized there was so much in France. You know, or, you know, they, they were actually having extraordinary adventures on their journeys. And this is actually during the ash cloud. I took this picture because I thought, I wonder when I'll ever see the kind of skies of London so pristine and blue uh, again. It was absolutely sort of magical uh, moment. And part of what I've done since I've got back from this trip has been inspired to come up with business ideas for viable commercial models which help to embody the changes that I would like to see and I think we need to see in the world. So um, as David alluded to, uh, I'm, I'm chairman of a business called Loco2. And we're trying to make it as easy to book a European train as it is to book a European plane. Because short haul is the one thing that there is a viable alternative to. OK, not all of us are mad like me, and we'll go to Australia on a cargo ship. Uh, but we can all travel by train in Europe. And so what Loco2 aims to do is to make that as simple and easy as, as doing a one-click flight booking. Equally, though, it's about changing mindsets. This is a wonderful Frenchman called Xavier de Maistre. And he wrote a book called Voyage Around My Room. Um, he was involved in a duel and got put under house arrest. And so he wrote an entire travel book about going on a journey, in talking about all the objects and, and kind of things he had in his bedroom. And that was really just about a change of mindset, you know, having to see the sense of wonder and finding joy and pleasure in actually the most mundane and every day. And this is Brixton Market, where I live, uh, in South London. And what London has in that sense is an incredible multiculturalism and diversity. Uh, and that's where it gets really exciting because I'm also involved in another project called World in London, which is basically an app which is designed to help you navigate the cultural diversity of your city. 
So it's designed to give you all the joys and pleasures of an international holiday, spending a day in China, spending a day in Brazil, spending a day in Jamaica, uh, all navigated by your mobile phone. And we're just doing a kickstart of fundraise um, for this at the moment. Um, and really the task, therefore, in a kind of Schopenhauer philosophical sense is not so much to see what no one yet has seen, but to think what nobody yet has thought about that which everybody sees to change our mindsets and to see the world in a different way. And if we can change our state of mind, then we can have extraordinary travel and tourist experiences which aren't necessarily high carbon, which aren't necessarily damaging to the world, and are the things which actually still give us the pleasure uh, that we seek. And really, for me, that's understanding what the story that serves is, a story that genuinely works for us, that works for our relationship with each other and works for our relationship with the planet. Because at the minute, the current story is broken. And it's up to us to start to draft a new story. Because if we do that, then we can genuinely change the world. Thank you very much.